my name is Karen Brewer. I am seven years old. I have blonde hair and freckles. I live in Stony Brook, Connecticut. I'm in Miss Coleman's second grade class. I sit in the front row next to my pretend husband, Ricky, because I wear glasses. My best enemy is Pamela Harding. She's also in Miss Coleman's class. So are my two best friends, Nancy and Hanny. Together, we are the three musketeers. One lives by my mommy's house, and the other lives by my daddy's house. Oops, I forgot to tell you that I'm a tutu. That's because mommy and daddy got a divorce. They lived in a big nine-bedroom house with me and my brother Andrew. He's four, going on five. Now mommy lives in a little house with my stepfather, Seth. Daddy still lives in the big house, but he got remarried, too, to my stepmother, Elizabeth. She came with many step-siblings for me and Andrew. Sam and Charlie are in high school. Christy is 13. She has a babysitting business with her friends. Dave and Michael is my age. They also adopted a baby from Vietnam. Her name is Emily. I named my pet rat after her. Elizabeth's mom also lives there. I call her Nanny. I'm bossy and think the entire world revolves around me. I win all of the prizes on contests in town. I'm always the best at everything, and if I'm not, I kill whoever is better than me so I can keep my crown. I'm stuck in this endless loop of second grade. Miss Coleman got married for her first time, yet for some reason we still refer to her as Ms. Coleman, which wasn't accurate before or after her wedding. Since second grade started, she's gotten engaged, married, pregnant, and had her baby. It's been a very long year. We've had 10 Halloweens. I've gone to several summer camps this summer alone. You know, the summer before and also after second grade, it's all the same summer. I've been to the same summer camp twice. I've been to circus camp, taken a swimming course, went to a farm camp. I'm very busy. My family also goes on many vacations. We've gone to New York several times, Washington, D.C., this lake that my daddy has a cabin on, Nebraska where my grandparents live, a ski trip, and so many more. In Miss Coleman's class, we've taken many field trips too, to the zoo, the dinosaur museum, a nursing home, and many more. We also have a a lot of class parties. We've had parties to welcome Miss Coleman back after her absences, for the birth of her baby, to say goodbye to substitute teachers, for our grandparents, for our mothers, for our pets, for every holiday. Several parties per holiday, might I add. What can I say? It's been a busy, busy year. Okay, now for a more serious introduction. This video is definitely not aimed at children. I will be swearing, so beware. This is for nostalgia purposes. When I was a child, I was in this book club. I would get mailed these every once in a while. I'm not sure on the frequency, but I never actually read all of them. All I remembered was that Karen was a tutu. I probably had only read maybe a dozen of these. I sat on this feeling of guilt for years that I had been given these and not actually read them. I'm not that same child anymore, but it's better late than never. Surprisingly, I finished all 122 books in the series, plus the six super specials, in only two and a half months while still maintaining to have a life. Each book only takes about an hour to read, so it wasn't too hard. When I started this project, I didn't know what direction it'd take. At first, I was just summarizing each book, and then I got too invested to the storyline, so my recaps turned into reviews and sometimes a rant, sometimes with a little bit too much emotion. Then I realized that Karen Brewer and the people of Stony Brook are all stuck in this endless loop of Karen's second grade year, and things got eerie. The recap I started this video with is basically the second chapter of every single book in the series. I read that over a hundred times and now her family tree will haunt me forever. Now if you're ready to take a trip down the 90s nostalgia of this memory lane, then hop on board. Here we go. Book number one, Karen's Witch. Karen thinks her dad's neighbor is a witch because she wears black, has a black cat, and grows herbs in her garden. Karen interrupts what she thinks is a neighbor's witch meeting, and it turns out that it was just a gardening club. Book number two, Karen's roller skates. She's roller skating, falls, and breaks her wrist. Everyone gives her a lot of attention at first, and then she gets annoyed when the attention stops. At the hospital, she runs into a classmate who has a cast, but his has writing on it. So she tries to get more and better signatures than him. She keeps lying about how she broke her arm and her wrist and the lie just keeps getting bigger and bigger every time she says it. She starts turning it into a competition and at the end she gets rewarded with a celebrity signature. So I'm not sure what the lesson is supposed to be here. Book number three, Karen's Worst Day. She complains about everything and is extremely rude to everyone. Her friend invites her bike riding and Karen calls her a toad. She starts to cheer up when she realizes that she had more bad things happen in one day than anyone else in the family ever has. And then her brother rewards her bad attitude by taking her out to get ice cream, because that's fair. Book number four, Karen's Kitty Cat Club. Karen tries to copy her sister's babysitting club, but with a kitty sitting club instead. She soon realizes that she's too young to run a business and starts a fun club instead. 
Book number five, Karen's school picture. Karen gets prescription glasses just before picture day and struggles deciding if she should wear them for the picture or not. Her classmate who broke a bone when she did also got glasses around the same time, so they ended up in a competition with each other again. She ends up wearing both pairs of glasses in her school picture. Book number six, Karen's little sister. This is supposed to be about her family adopting another child, but it's instead about Karen wanting a pet. Book number seven, Karen's birthday. This is supposed to be about Karen's seventh birthday, but she spends it trying to trick her parents to get back together and everyone misinterprets it as her being greedy. Well, kind of accurately points out how greedy she is. Her parents agree to be more civil while still not getting back together, considering they're both happily married. Book number eight, Karen's haircut. Her best friend is getting married and she's supposed to be a bridesmaid, but then she loses teeth and is deemed too ugly, so she goes to get her hair done, but the hairdresser cuts Karen's hair way too short. When her friend sees it, she tells her that she can't be a bridesmaid anymore because she's not beautiful. I hate this story so much on so many different levels, but it really does suck that hairdressers never fucking cut your hair. That's not cool. In editing this, I just realized the hairdresser's hairstyle and Karen, you shouldn't have gone to her. You should have known. Book number nine, Karen's sleepover. Karen invites all the girls in her class over for a sleepover, much like the Mary-Kate and Ashley movie. That's all I kept picturing the entire time I read this. Book number 10, Karen's Grandmothers. Karen's class adopts grandparents. Her friend Nancy is scared of old people, so she doesn't adopt one, even though she has none in real life. Karen has four and adopts a fifth. Soon she realizes that she doesn't have the same interests as her new grandma, but introduces Nancy to her, who decides to adopt her instead. Is there an age limit on adopting grandparents? Is this still even a thing these days? I don't ever really hear about this. Book 11, Karen's Prize. Karen's really into spelling bees now and is aiming to win the state championship. Once she starts winning, she starts boasting about her success, which annoys nearly everyone around her. Ricky isn't too bothered, though, and he sends Karen a flirty note, which I found cute. Karen is talking to her friend about what she should do with the prize money, and the friend says, I think you should give me half of it for listening to you spell all day. The sass. She ends up losing and apologizing to everyone for being a sore winner. Book 12, Karen's Ghost. This is the first Halloween special. Don't worry, we have many more to come. Karen's into this story of a ghost living in her house, and her and her friends celebrate Halloween. This is definitely the best one so far. Number 13, Karen's Surprise. Say it's a missed opportunity that number 13 wasn't the Halloween special, but oh well. This is the Thanksgiving special. Karen's class puts on a Thanksgiving play where Karen tries to hog all of the attention. On Thanksgiving, Karen and her brother have to eat two feasts in one day, and they end up feeling really sick, so their parents decide to do it on separate days next year. Book 14, Karen's New Year. They kind of skipped over Christmas and gave us a New Year's special where her dad throws a party and Karen learns what resolutions are. She gets mad at everyone for not keeping their resolutions and gets in trouble for spying on everyone. I was amused by a line in the beginning of chapter 5 that says her brother wanting gun from a gumball machine. That typo is pure gold in a children's book. In the end, Ricky proposed with a paper flower that he made himself and I thought it was super cute. Book 15, Karen's in Love, the Valentine's Day special. In this one, Karen and Ricky get married on the playground. It's cute, don't have much else to say. Number 16, Karen's goldfish. Karen gets a pet goldfish, then it dies, and she replaces it. I hate this one. Book 17, Karen's Brothers. In this one, Karen asks Ricky if she can play football with him, and he says no because she's a girl. Then she asks to go to the movies with her brothers, and the same thing happens. So she makes a We Hate Boys Club. She feels bad after a couple of weeks and throws a party to apologize to all of the boys, and then she's allowed to play football. Why am I starting to feel invested into this series? Book 18, Karen's Home Run. Karen gets in a slump and doesn't want to play with her team anymore because she basically feels like a burden, but eventually she does play again and she does well. Book 19, Karen's Goodbye. Karen's friend Amanda moves away and Karen throws her a surprise going away party. I completely forgot about the character Amanda until I was just making that voice memo and reading my old notes. Book 20, Karen's Carnival. Karen and her friends are all trying to raise money to build a new playground. She quickly learns that it takes money to make money. Ricky, the seven-year-old, is more romantic than most adults these days. Book 21, Karen's New Teacher. Karen's teacher needs surgery, and now there will be a substitute teacher for a month. At first, everyone hates the sub, but they figure out how to click better. This included a great tongue twister in it. The paper passer passed out paper. Side note about the cover, I had a girl in my class that looked just like the redhead on this. Does every second grade class have the one redhead girl with extremely curly hair and bangs? 
Book 22, Karen's Little Witch. Karen's neighbor's granddaughter moves in next door for a few weeks and Karen thinks she's a witch too until she gets to know her better and realizes that she's just a normal girl. Book 23, Karen's Doll. Karen gets a fancy doll from England. When her friend has surgery for appendicitis, Karen lends her her doll, only her friend thinks it's for keeps. They end up agreeing to do shared custody of the doll. Book 24, Karen's School Trip. The flu makes its way around school and Karen worries that it'll interfere with their field trip to the zoo. They end up making it still. Early in this, they call Charlie and the Chocolate Factory a new book, which confused me because it was published in 1964, three decades before this was. I do like how they point out how animals probably don't like being at the zoo. I hate glamorizing zoos. Book 25, Karen's Pen Pal. Karen's class becomes pen pals with another class. She and her pen pal end up lying to each other a lot to try to impress each other, but they end up meeting in real life and have to come clean. Book 26, Karen's Ducklings. Karen's class writes a book about a wild duckling that is living in the school's courtyard. Is that a thing? Students writing books for their libraries? I never heard of that, and I never did that in school. Book 27, Karen's Big Joke. For April Fool's Day, everyone is playing jokes on each other. Not much else happens. Kind of boring. Book 28, Karen's Tea Party. Karen and her classmates start taking ballroom dance classes. The boys end up not liking it for having to be so proper. Karen throws a girls-only tea party to enjoy dressing fancy and having good manners without the boys. The boys end up crashing the party and having a good time, which leads them to enjoy the class more. Book 29, Karen's Cartwheel. Karen is upset because she didn't get on the gymnastics team. Her and her friends earn money to buy matching dolls, but Karen's gymnastics stress makes her snap at her friends. She ends up getting better at gymnastics, but there's no room on the team for her, and her and her friends get their dolls. I took a month of gymnastics and also could not do a cartwheel. I feel her pain in this one. Book 30, Karen's Kittens. Karen finds a stray cat in her dad's shed who is about to have kittens. Once she does, Karen throws a kitten party to find homes for the new kittens. I love that no one is purchasing a living being in this, but I hate that the entire family got broken up. Like, can't you keep some of them together? Book 31, Karen's Bully. Bobby moves in down the street to Karen's house, and they get in a bully war. One of the battles included underwear, which happened with my neighbors when I was a kid. Is that a thing that kids do? They just steal each other's underwear and taunt people with it. They end up becoming friends in the end. Book 32, Karen's Pumpkin Patch. This is the third Halloween in the series, and she's still seven years old. Make it make sense. In this one, she takes care of her dad's pumpkin patch and tried growing the biggest one for a contest. The neighborhood's parents allowed the kids to go egg and toilet paper houses on mischief night, which is odd to me. After Karen goes in for the night, some kids get into her pumpkin patch and smash her big pumpkin, which makes her cry. One year when I was a kid, we carved like eight pumpkins or so, and someone came and smashed them down the street, and I cried a lot too. That's such a cruel thing to do. I don't understand people. I want to smash a pumpkin on the head, every pumpkin smashing bully that there is. Luckily, my dad was nice enough to get us new pumpkins, but it's still not the same. Book 33, Karen's Secret. Karen's class tries playing the game telephone, but she blurts the sentence out when it gets to her turn. Natalie tells her a secret in which she tells someone who tells someone else, and it gets morphed into something else, of course. This is why you don't tell secrets that aren't your own. Her class reads the Magic School Bus books, which I didn't even know existed. I thought it was just a TV show. You'll learn something new every day. Book 34, Karen's Snow Day. Karen and her friends make a lot of plans for a snow day, but they get stuck working for her brothers after they got them a lot of work without telling them about it, so they ended up way backed up and had to help. The heater breaks at school the next day, and they get a chance to do their snow day activities after all. It was summer when I read this, and I put a note here that the snow talk is getting me excited for winter, but then our summer extended until almost Halloween. I don't understand the weather anymore. The seasons are shifting. Book 35, Karen's Doll Hospital. Hyacinthia breaks and she meets a guy who fixes toys. I kept picturing Geppetto from Pinocchio for the toy repair guy. Book 36, Karen's New Friend. Addie, a girl in a wheelchair, joins Karen's class and Karen decides to do everything for her and be her best friend, even though she doesn't need that. Addie becomes frustrated with Karen. At home, Karen's cousins are doing the same thing to her because her parents are divorced and she makes the connection that she's doing that to Addie just because she's in a wheelchair. Be friends with the person, not the situation that they're in. Also, Miss Coleman, before Addie comes to the class, she just talks about her condition and stuff. I don't know. It's I feel like it's good, but it's also kind of like private. You should probably ask the student before you just share all of the details of their condition. 
Book 37, Karen's Tuba. Karen's class has a music unit where they each learn a new instrument to play. My school didn't have that as a kid. We had a thing where you could learn if you rented your instrument from an outside source, but it was usually an after-school program. It wasn't like part of our school. I mean, it was part of the school, but it wasn't part of the normal curriculum. Book 38, Karen's Big Lie. Karen's class starts taking timed math quizzes. She struggles with doing math quickly, so she copies Ricky's answers and keeps lying about it until she finally comes clean in the end. I remember those quizzes in elementary school, and I was top of my class in them, but as I got older, I could not handle time tests at all. I go into test panic, which still happens to me when I get tested on anything. I don't agree with timing those. It's not fair to expect everyone to think at the same speed. I really hope that it's set up differently these days. It's just the timing of things shouldn't matter. It should be about if you know the material. Book 39, Karen's Wedding. Karen's teacher gets married and she's the flower girl. I don't really know why this is called Karen's Wedding when it's her teacher's wedding, but okay. Book 40, Karen's Newspaper. Karen and her friends make a newspaper for kids and quickly realize how difficult it is to do weekly. I used to want to do this as a kid. I don't think I ever actually did it though. They end up stopping their paper because it's too much work, but the adult paper hires them to help with a kid's article. Is that even legal to hire kids? I don't know. Book 41, Karen's School. Karen's class gets a student teacher that she butts heads with, and she also starts a school of her own and butts heads with her students. Interesting how whatever happens in school rolls over into her home life. Hmm, how convenient. Book 42, Karen's Pizza Party. Karen becomes pizza queen and nearly kills her class pet. Don't love this one. Book 43, Karen's Toothache. Karen's adult tooth is growing in, but her baby tooth is being stubborn and won't fall out, so she has to go get it pulled. The oral surgeon puts her tooth on a chain for her. Does that actually happen? I never got a gangster tooth chain as a kid, and I wish that I had. She also learns about horoscopes in this book and decides to temporarily be a psychic. Book 44, Karen's Big Weekend. In every other book up to this point, chapter 2 explains how her divorced family works and how there's two of everything. And then 44 books in, they change it on me and they make it chapter 3. But anyway, in this one, Karen goes to New York for a weekend and gets to visit with her pen pal while she's there. Book 45, Karen's Twin. Karen's class has family day where they make family trees. A girl in her class is very lonely at home, so she and Karen decide to be twins. Also, Emily gets officially adopted into the family. Book 46, Karen's Babysitter. Andrew and Karen need a babysitter for two weeks, so Christy's boyfriend Bart does it, and Karen gets a big crush on him and then sabotages his job when the feelings aren't reciprocated. Book 47, Karen's Kite. Karen's class learns about flight and takes a field trip to an airport and a kite store. It baffles me how often they go on field trips. Also, all of the events at the school. In this one, they have a sleepover at the school for the kite flying competition, which, like, makes no sense. Why are the two connected? Karen always conveniently wins everything, so of course she wins the contest. This series doesn't do a great job at showing the frequent disappointment that is real life, and that in itself disappoints me, so I guess it has that going for it. Book 48, Karen's Two Families. Karen decides that she doesn't like only going to her dad's house every other weekend, so she asks for equal time with each parent. And since in this series she gets everything she wants, they agree to switch off monthly from now on. It must be convenient to have that divorce attorney in your back pocket at all times. And have no idea how her mom affords that, especially because she's super tight on money. Book 49, Karen's Stepmother. Now that Karen is spending an entire month at her dad's house, she has to get used to her stepmom. Karen doesn't like that she has a different set of rules and suggestions than her birth mother does, so she pouts and lies to her mom, saying she got permission to come over when she didn't, and then she gives her stepmom dead flowers on Mother's Day because she's an evil little bitch. A side storyline in this is that she makes a go-kart, and of course she wins a race because she wins everything. It's so annoying at this point. Book 50, Karen's Lucky Penny. Karen finds a lucky penny and then finds a wallet with $800 in it because of course she does. Why wouldn't she? She returns it and gets a $100 reward, which she blows on her friends willingly and then bitches at them when she's broke. It's like, girl, you did that to yourself. Book 51, Karen's Big Top. Summer this year holds a circus camp that Karen and a lot of her classmates attend. I love the circus, and I'd love this one a lot more if it didn't have animals involved. I'd like some vegan circuses, please. That would be great. Book 52, Karen's Mermaid. In August, her family takes a long vacation to a beach where this girl Margot brags a lot and annoys Karen. Then Karen lies about seeing a mermaid and Margot starts writing letters to Karen as the mermaid, which makes Karen start to believe that mermaids are actually real, but it all ends up being a joke on her. 
It ends with them being selected to ride in the sea parade with the Miss Mermaid Lady because, of course, Karen, who is selected out of the entire crowd, of course. This girl really gets everything. Book 53, Karen School Bus. I've always been jealous that Karen got rides to school every day, but this year she starts riding the bus. I'm not really sure why things change. She's so nervous that she pukes the first day and then gets ridiculed for it. I just feel so bad for her. Kids are cruel. She quits riding the bus, but then the driver assigns seats for everyone and makes the bully sit by him, so she ends up being okay with riding the bus. Book 54, Karen's Candy. It's Halloween time again here in Stony Brook for the fourth fucking time, and Karen's school is having a candy selling drive to raise money for the library. Her and Pamela are in competition to sell the most candy, and as tension rises, Karen ends up hitting Pamela. Their punishment for fighting is not being allowed to be in the Halloween parade, but they bond with their toxic new friendship and sneak in anyway. Both end up losing the candy selling competition, but at least they have each other now. Book 55. Karen's Magician. Her family goes to a magic show where her brother's special penny disappears and she tries to explain that it's all just tricks, but he doesn't comprehend. Book 56. Karen's Ice Skates. Karen really wants ice skates and her grandparents show up and conveniently gift her some. Then she wants to use them and her teacher conveniently is teaching the class how to rescue someone if they fall through the ice right before she goes to a pond with her friends and one of them falls through the ice. I wish school had taught us more useful stuff like this when I went rather than x to the third power plus 87 squared. A tiny bit of algebra and geometry is helpful in life, yes, I will admit that. Thank you. But the rest of math, beyond that, is only helpful in very specific careers, whereas basic safety issues are useful for everyone to have. Book 57, Karen's School Mystery. The real mystery here is the 2-2 explanation being the second half of the third chapter. But anyway. This one is basically about hall monitors. Karen and Addie are elected. There's a bunch of stealing going on and they catch the thieves. Something that bothered me in this was that in front of the entire class, Leslie said Addie couldn't be on patrol because she's a girl in a wheelchair and Ms. Coleman just ignores it. Like, what the fuck? That girl should get in trouble or at least have a stern talking to. That's a horrible thing to say. Book 58, Karen's Ski Trip. Karen's family goes on a ski trip where she meets a boy named Keegan. They enter an ice skating contest together and go to a Valentine's Day dance as dates, but at the end they just say bye. Every girl she meets she tries to be pen pals with, but not this boy who she had so much chemistry with? Why? They're so cute together. I wish they would have agreed to be pen pals or something. Book 59, Karen's Leprechaun. Karen and her brother find a dog and name him Lucky. They put up found dog posters everywhere, and one person who calls describes the dog exactly, but when she says the name is Bessie, Karen's mom says the dog can't be the caller's dog because the dog is a boy. That's not a great assumption. Names don't have a gender. It's just a weird thing to say because names don't have gender, but okay. Later in the book, Andrew tells Karen the dog can't wear a bow because he's a boy. Bows and names don't have genders. It also bothers me that her letters always have spelling mistakes, even though she's a really good speller the rest of the time in the series. Book 60, Karen's Pony. Karen's family goes to an estate sale that includes farm animals. She sees a pony and her dad just casually buys her a pony. It's so interesting to me how when they're on vacations and she wants a snack that costs a dollar, they make her pay for it herself and work hard to earn like 25 cents at a time. But then here they are just buying her a freaking pony. Book 61, Karen's Tattletale. Keeping up with the vibe of the whole series, Karen, of course, gets a solo in a performance at school. And when the adults at school switch places with the students, she gets selected to be the nurse, which is exactly what she wanted to do, even though it's supposedly a random drawing for selection. The convenience is strong in this one. Book 62, Karen's New Bike. Something is clearly very wrong with Miss Anne M. Martin, because again, she has put the tutu explanation in chapter 3. This book is about Karen getting her new bike and then it being sold to another family and Karen gets her bike back and gives the girl who ended up buying her stolen bike her old bike. It's really sad that some people out there will really steal from children for monetary gain. Book 63, Karen's Movie. Her grandpa has a heart attack and she makes him a movie with her friends to cheer him up. Book 64, Karen's Lemonade Stand. The weather is hot in Stony Brook, so Karen starts a lemonade stand, which inspires her friends to sell things too. They take all the proceeds and give it to rebuild the school bleachers. 
Book 65, Karen's Toys. Andrew and Karen go see a Toy Story-esque movie, and there's a bunch of debate on if it's too violent for children. Karen sneaks and buys toy guns from the movie, and then the town throws a fit, and they end up having a toy drive where all of the toy weapons are donated. Book 66, Karen's Monsters. I swear I blinked and this was over. Just another sign that we're all in a simulation here with yet another Halloween installment of Baby Sister's Little Sister. Halloween number five and still more to come. Book 67, Karen's Turkey Day. This one includes that Chain Hang Low song, but with ears instead of chain. And I had no idea the song originated from a child song. You learn something new every day. Also, Karen makes peanut butter and jelly crackers, and that sounds so disgusting to me. Has anyone actually tried that? Is that a thing? Like, I'm assuming people have tried it, but is that actually something that people like? That sounds horrible. Book 68, Karen's Angel. Andrew and Karen are in charge of getting an angel for their Christmas tree, but they break it and have to hand make one instead. Book 69, Karen's Big Sister. Welcome to another installment of Karen getting rewarded for being a terrible person. Her dad gets a family heirloom. It's a fancy pin with real gold, diamonds, and pearls. He immediately gives it to Christy, Karen's stepsister, and Karen gets so dang mad. She ends up stealing it and losing it. Christy obviously gets upset, but then Karen gets upset at Christy for being mad about it. She yells at her and tells her she shouldn't have even gotten it in the first place because she's not his real kid. This little bitch is so lucky that I'm not Christy. For some reason, far beyond me, Christy actually chases Karen down to apologize, forgive her, and then buys her sister forever bracelets. I hate it. She's always getting rewarded for being a terrible kid. In other news, I couldn't get my hands on this one for a while, so I read it towards the end of all the rest, and now it makes so much more sense that Miss Coleman had a baby since she announces the pregnancy in this. Karen's class throws a baby shower for her, and Nanny suggests that Karen knits a blanket for the baby. I don't think babies are supposed to have blankets made of yarn, are they? I thought that was a choking hazard or like a safety hazard because the string could get loose. Maybe I'm just overly paranoid, but I thought that was a thing that you weren't supposed to give babies. Book 70, Karen's Granddad. Her grandpa dies in this one, and I got a little choked up reading it. Karen makes a paper guinea pig for her grandma, and her grandma says she is looking fat today. Maybe she is a girl after all. I'm so confused what the hell that's supposed to mean. Book 71, Karen's Island Adventure. Her family goes on a tropical vacation. I don't really have any commentary for this one. Book 72, Karen's New Puppy. I hate this one. Her family's dog keeps getting out, and one time the dog is gone for a week and a half, so they decide to get a new puppy, which I don't agree with. That's way too soon to just replace your dog. They decide that dog is too much, so they give them away. And that family decides that the dog is too much and gives them back. Then they find their old dog and give away the new one to the people who found the old one. It's a lot of back and forth. But if you don't want an animal, then yes, absolutely find them a new home. I just wish everyone had thought more before getting a dog in the first place. Some are high maintenance. I don't know, if you're in the right loving place to adopt a dog in, you shouldn't just give up on them after a week. But like I said, if you don't want the dog, then yes, please give them to someone who actually does. Book 73, Karen's Dinosaur. Something is wrong in the Matrix again because the 2-2 chapter is chapter 4 this time. And are you doing okay? Also, Karen says they went to New York last December to see Maxie, but she was with her big house family back in Stony Brook in the most recent book that takes place in December. Miss Coleman has gotten engaged, married, pregnant, and gave birth all while Karen is in second grade and has had a dozen Halloweens. Time moves, but also does not move in the series. Book 74, Karen's Softball Mystery. Karen asks Natalie if her socks are okay in the middle of the game because they're droopy. Why do they mention her droopy socks in like every book? Is that a thing people actually gossip about? The position of your freaking socks? Why does it matter? Like, I don't know, sometimes I purposely wear my socks droopy. I don't understand why she's always taunting this poor girl for her droopy socks. It's a fashion choice. Book 75, Karen's County Fair. All I have to say on this one is that goats are not props. Book 76, Karen's Magic Garden. At a family reunion, she meets a cousin and they click really well. They make memory boxes to hide in a magic garden that they find. Karen hopes to see her cousin again at next year's family reunion and mentions that she'll be eight. I'd bet money that she's going to be seven years old next August because that's how this entire series works. She's always seven years old in August and October and every other month. Book 77, Karen's School Surprise. Miss Coleman's class gets selected to be on a game show. Karen makes jokes about a catfish forgetting to shave, and then her stunt ends up involving being squirted with shaving cream. What a coincidence. 
This is the first book that ends with a cliffhanger with her being mad at David Michael. I'm ready for this to turn into a soap opera. Book 78, Karen's half birthday. She's finally aging. She says that she's seven. Some kids in her class are seven and a half and some have turned eight already. So she's acknowledging that time does move forward while it also being the sixth Halloween in her second grade year. She throws a party to celebrate her half birthday here in October 1996, but she turns seven in March of 1990. Make it make sense. Book 79, Karen's Big Fight. This one shows how bullies are just jealous. Karen is jealous of all the attention that David Michael has been getting, so she starts teasing him for his role in his school play. Book 80, Karen's Christmas Tree. In this book, Karen says she is seven years old, but she says that her and Andrew being in charge of the angel was last year when she was also seven years old. Hmm. Book 81, Karen's Accident. Karen falls out of her treehouse and ruptures her spleen. Book 82, Karen's Secret Valentine. What? Lost your mittens? You naughty kitten. Now you shall have no pie. That's a direct quote from the beginning of this book. I'm so confused as to what it means and I'm not sure if it's from something and I'm just not getting it. The plot in this one is like Secret Santas but with Valentines. Karen's brother David Michael develops a crush on Hanny but she doesn't reciprocate and keeps saying how gross boys are. Book 83, Karen's Bunny. I have so much hatred for this one. The premise is that their grandmother gives her and Andrew each a bunny for Easter. Just no. Don't ever gift an animal to someone without consulting them first. Think of them as human children. The recipient will have to take care and feed that animal for the rest of their lives just because you wanted to give them a cute little gift. Don't do it. Especially for Easter. Every year, so many dumbass families get bunnies and chicks and then go, oh, that was so cute. And then two days later, let's just return these living fucking creatures back to the store. Or worse. Just please do not do it. And if you do anyway, then fuck you. I hate you. Go away. But please at least adopt and don't shop. My next issue lies with her mom. Karen collects food for her brother's food drive for families in need. She goes to half the houses on the street, and when she goes to drop off that load of food, Andrew starts yelling at her that she ruined his projects because he was supposed to go to three houses himself, and the neighbors won't donate to him now because they already donated to Karen. The mom even mentions returning the food to the neighbors and tells Andrew that he'll just bring some of the food to class and explain what happened to his teacher. Why are y'all so fucking stupid? Karen fucked up, sure. She apologized. She only went to half the neighbors. Andrew can still go do his three houses out of the remaining half of the neighborhood and complete his assignment. Then he can bring into class that along with all that Karen collected. It's for charity. Yeah, she butted in, but she's literally feeding the homeless families in her community. Why are y'all tripping so much? It just made me so mad. Book 84, Karen's Big Job. This one is take your daughter to work day, and then her class has a career week where the parents come in and explain their job. I always see this on TV, but I don't think this happened for me when I was in school. Is this an actual thing? Do they still do this? I don't know. I'm curious. Let me know. Book 85, Karen's Treasure. Karen found a secret treasure map in the wall of her house that led to a coin collection from the 1930s. Book 86, Karen's Phone Trouble. Karen hogs the phone line constantly, and at the end, she switches to email, but this takes place in the 90s? That'll still clog the phone line. Where's the solution? Book 87, Karen's Pony Camp. Only comment is that ponies are not vehicles. Book 88, Karen's Puppet Show. Karen goes to her second camp of the summer, more like her 22nd camp during the summer that she was seven years old. But yeah, sure, let's call it the second one. This one is an arts camp and her friends don't go with her, so she makes a mean puppet show about them not going. Book 89, Karen's Unicorn. The circus comes to town with a real live unicorn. Karen makes wishes and when they're granted, she thinks that's proof that the unicorn is real, but her parents point out that she basically manifested those things and made them come true herself because she believed that the unicorn was real and was gonna grant her wish. Book 90, Karen's Haunted House. On page 16, she says her dad said she was too young for haunted houses last year, but now she's seven and can go to one, but she's been seven years old for the last seven Halloweens. Book 91, Karen's Pilgrim. Karen has a school project of Thanksgiving and she pulls up Bill and Ted and hires role-playing pilgrims to come in for her school presentation. I find it so odd that everyone in America is so suddenly woke and considers everything cultural appropriation, yet little kids dress up as pilgrims and Native Americans every November. You can't just pick and choose these things. Like if one is cultural appropriation, then it all is, and if it's wrong, then it all is. 
I hear many other races say that the people who get most worked up over cultural appropriation are white people. Some people just need to chill the fuck out. I'm Native American, and guess what? I don't give a fuck if some girl wants to wear a headdress and go get fucked up at a festival for a weekend. Headdresses are beautiful. I get it. Just calm your tits. Everything's gonna be okay. I'm not offended. Like, it's fine. Like, people just need to not make everything in the world a problem. Moving on from that, the role-playing pilgrims that Karen meets called the goat they get milk from Phil Pale. That's like naming a dog Chew's Bones. It's so literal. They also brought up Natalie's drooping socks again. I don't get it. Are they making fun of her because she's poor or something and has to wear hand-me-down socks that can't fit her? Or are they skinny shaming her since they can't stay up? Like, I just don't get it. It's never explained, but they always bring up her droopy socks. Book 92, Karen's Sleigh Ride. Again, animals aren't vehicles. Book 93, Karen's Cooking Contest. It's real convenient how what she's doing in class always lines up with her personal life. The class is making a cookbook while Nanny is competing in a cooking contest. Karen steals one of Nanny's recipes to put in the school's book and still manages to not get punished and enters the contest with Nanny. To fix the problem, she pulls out the page with the secret recipe from all the copies of the book in a very Gilmore Girls, Madeline, and Louise moment. Side note, I read this one out of order to you because I was waiting on someone else to finish it, so I was so confused when Nanny announced that she'd be starting her own chocolate business because she had already been doing that in the several books that I had read. Book 94, Karen Snow Princess. At this point in the series, even the kids these are aimed at have got to be annoyed with the 2-2 chapter in every single book. They also bring up Natalie's droopy socks again. What is with it and the droopy socks? Do people actually pay attention to people's socks this much? What the heck is going on with these people? Maybe she likes her socks loose. Maybe she doesn't want them squeezing her calves all day. Let the girl live and wear her socks how she wants. Book 95, Karen's Promise. Whoever had the idea, Miss Anne M. Martin, I'm looking at you, to name three characters in this series, Nanny, Nancy, and Natalie, you deserve jail time. It is so frustrating trying to read. But anyway, in this one, Nanny starts selling homemade candy. She's so swamped with business and selfish little Karen promises her class some free samples without asking. And she gets rewarded by Nanny just to be like, oh, okay, let's make them baskets too. I'm curious how Karen would be as an adult because she basically gets everything she wants in this series all of the time. I feel like that's not really setting her up for reality as an adult very well. There's another dilemma in this where Seth gets a six-month job in Chicago and him, her mom, and her brother are all moving, but Karen gets to decide for herself. She promised Andrew they'd stay together, but she really wants to stay in Stony Brook. This brings on the second cliffhanger with Karen still being undecided on what her decision will be. Book 96, Karen's Big Move. Karen decides to move with her little house family to Chicago for six months, but only because she promised Andrew. She hates the thought of leaving home for six months. Her parents have one month on, one month off custody. I don't get why she didn't ask to stay home the first and last months and then stay in Chicago for months two through five. Then it would have been less of a commitment for her and she wouldn't be missing out on so much time at the big house or even divvied it up so it's three months with each parent like it's supposed to be in the custody arrangement but just close clump them together to save on travel costs. It would have been good for her to see a new town. She could have just gone for the summer too. I just hate her attitude about it, but to each their own. At her goodbye party, Miss Coleman says, see you next fall. We'll see about that. I have a feeling she's going to be in the same fall that it was last year, and the year before that, and the year before that, and the year before that. Book 97, Karen's Paper Route. A new video game system is coming out and Karen wants it so she gets a job delivering papers with Christy to help pay for it. She befriends a lady who trades gifts with her every day but ends up giving up the job to her brother instead. Book 98, Karen's Fishing Trip. Karen's big house family goes on a week-long vacation over Father's Day. I was pleasantly surprised that the fishing was minimal in this one. I was scared to read it. Karen's friend from the ski trip makes a return, and I love him with Karen. I could see them being vacation flings when they're older. Book 99, Karen's Big City Mystery. Karen goes to Chicago to visit her little house family. While she's there, there's a burglary, and she's determined to crack the case. Once he's found, no one presses charges because he has a sob story. He needs to face some sort of punishment to learn, so that annoyed me, but I do like the Scooby-Doo Nancy Drew vibe of this one. 
Book 100, Karen's Book. Karen writes an autobiography. One of my classes in school also had this assignment. I don't think children writing about themselves is going to make them any less self-centered in the social media age, so I hope they don't do that anymore. Although Karen wrote hers on her own accord, that's essentially what an influencer does these days. We're all screwed. In editing this, I realized that the picture on the front of her book is the picture on the front of the main book, so it's very Macaulay Culkin t-shirt vibes. Book 101, Karen's Chain Letter. This one upsets me a lot. Karen gets a chain letter in the mail that said to send out 10 postcards and she'd get good luck. Her dad says she can't give out her address so she has them sent to school. The school should have gone straight to her dad and her dad should have had them shredded. That's so dangerous and he said no when she asked. But Karen always gets what Karen wants so the office lady brought bags and bags of the postcards directly to Karen. The other kids complained and Miss Coleman made Karen share the stamps on her postcards. What if everyone liked Karen's hair? Would she make her cut it off and hand it out to everyone? I'm just so confused by the logic of that. She shouldn't be keeping these postcards anyway, but if you're gonna let her have them, they should just be hers. She shouldn't be forced to share something that's hers. By the end, so many of the kids are receiving their own postcards, but Miss Coleman still makes everyone put them all together and reply to random ones. Just let them respond to their own postcards. That's so odd. Can you imagine sending a postcard to some girl who sounds interesting and then some random guy responds talking about his toy worms or something? Plus, making up postcard day is just rewarding Karen for breaking so many rules. I hate it so much. Book 102, Karen's Black Cat. Welcome to the eighth Halloween of the series. Karen's dad's old cat, Boo Boo, is getting really old and tired, so their solution is to get a brand new kitten. I hate that mentality. Like in the book where they immediately replace the dog that they thought had died. Now they don't even wait for the cat to die. They just replace him and let him watch them do it. Just seems really disrespectful and I hate it. Book 103, Karen's Movie Star. A movie is being filmed at Karen's house. This is full of that cliche that movie stars wish they had average lives and average people wish they were famous. Unfortunately, Boo Boo dies in this one, which is really sad, but they built it up for several books, so it was pretty expected at this point. Book 104, Karen's Christmas Carol. Karen and her little brother, Andrew, are in a Christmas play at the community center. Karen plays a boy called Ignorance, which is perfect for her character of the whole series. She's mean to Andrew because he has a bigger role in the play, but Andrew is still being overly nice to her. It's just really sad to see their dynamic. Book 105, Karen's Nanny. This one's lesson is that change isn't always bad. She says school is one thing that never changes, which is actually very accurate because she's been in Miss Coleman's second grade class for so many years now. Book 106, Karen's President. Karen's big house goes to visit the White House, and of course, she happens to meet the president while she's there. The plot convenience is so extreme in this series. Book 107, Karen's Copycat. Andrew and Karen have a new nanny who also teaches pottery. She and Andrew take her course. Karen wants to impress the nanny, so she copies another girl in class, and Andrew is still missing his mom, so he starts copying Karen to feel closer to someone familiar. Copying is a really frustrating thing to deal with. I feel like in one way or another, most people do it in their lives, but just try your best not to. Just be yourself. It's better than being a copy. Book 108, Karen's Field Day. The main plot in this isn't even about Field Day. The class had an assignment to write a report on the most interesting woman in their family. Karen rips off a whole movie plot and adds details of many women in her family to make one super interesting woman. Book 109, Karen's Show and Share. Miss Coleman's class goes on a field trip to their retirement home again, and each student is supposed to present something for show and tell, or show and share, according to Ann M. Martin. Karen makes up this whole pretend story that she knows a famous baseball player. The player happens to be her pretend husband Ricky's favorite player. She makes up a bunch of lies and gives him a fake autograph. He calls her out, but then ends up defending her when people in class keep trying to get her to talk about him more. She ends up getting a real autograph to Ricky. I keep wanting them to hug. Give me a reboot of this series where Karen actually ages so we can read about her awkward first date where she hugs Ricky or Keegan, her vacation buddy. Book 110, Karen's Swim Meet. Karen joins a summer swim club taught by an Olympic swimmer but doesn't like how harsh she is. This one is really weird. A parent asks the coach why he's being harsh one day and then he just quits right then and walks out. Book 111, Karen's Spy Mystery. This one is another Nancy Drew-esque story. 
Nancy's family is out of town for two weeks, and they have one of her dad's co-workers from the bank come watch their house. Karen is very suspicious of this guy, so she spies on him, and it turns out that he was stealing from the bank the whole time. Book 112, Karen's New Holiday. August has no holidays, and Karen's not okay with that, so she and her friends make up a new one. I honestly hate the way this one works out. Karen had an idea, and she just wanted her friends to help out. But they took over and called her bossy for trying to lead her own team. It makes me terrified to ever have a crew of anyone for my own company. If someone starts something, they deserve ownership until they pass the project on to someone else's hands. Like, it's not fair for everyone to just take over just because they were, like, small helping hands in the project. I don't know. I don't like it. Book 113. Karen's Hurricane. Hurricane Karen hits Stony Brook, and they get over a foot of rain. At one point, Christy rows a boat over to Karen's mom's house, which was always a dream of mine as a child. I always thought that would actually happen when it rained, but it never did. Book 114, Karen's Chicken Pox. This one is so annoying. Karen's little sister Emily gets chicken pox, and the family says she needs to be quarantined, but then they make everyone in the house help her, and they let her sit at the table during meals, so of course Karen ends up getting it. No one knows how to quarantine, and that's exactly why COVID is still so prevalent after nearly three years. People are so stupid, and I'm so mad at this family for forcing her to expose herself to the chicken pox. What if she got it and died? People are so selfish. The plot convenience in this one is Karen planning to dress up as a chicken for her ninth Halloween this year before anyone even got the chicken pox. Book 115, Karen's Runaway Chicken. Miss Coleman's class wins an essay writing contest and the prize is a turkey. I hate that so much and I hate so much about this book in general, but I'm just happy they didn't eat him and they gave him to a farm at the end. And I really hope that they didn't eat him either. Book 116, Karen's Reindeer. Karen tries so hard to be good and accidentally is more naughty as a result. Book 117, Karen's Mistake. This one kind of just lumps a blob of stuff together. Karen's family has a New Year's party. She thinks Nanny is in love. Hanny thinks a pop star is in love with her. I feel like Karen's Misunderstanding would have been a better title for this one. Book 118, Karen's Figure 8. Karen takes up figure skating classes, but decides not to pursue it because it's really hard work. Book 119, Karen's Yo-Yo. Karen's whole class is getting really into yo-yoing. This one's pretty boring. Book 120, Karen's Easter Parade. Karen's cousin Diana comes to town and tries bullying Karen to steal and be a brat, but Karen doesn't budge, which is so unlike her because she's always a brat. Book 121, Karen's Gift. Karen starts walking docks to earn money to buy Mother's Day gifts. I never even think to hire a seven-year-old to be responsible for a dog. Like, that's so odd to me. Book 122, Karen's Cowboy. Karen and her mom's side of the family go to a dude ranch for a week. She returns just in time for her ninth Halloween celebration. And that's it for the main part of the series. But wait, there's more. There's also a six-part super special series. Super special one, Karen's Wish. I'm not sure of when in the timeline this takes place, and I'm too lazy to try to figure it out. It's after Karen's class adopts grandparents and before the custody of her and Andrew is month to month. That's as far as I know. This one is a Christmas special. Karen is too scared to ask for multiple things, so she only asks that her grandma that's in the hospital gets better. She also celebrates some of Hanukkah with Nancy, and then Nancy spends some of Christmas with Karen. I remember as a kid, I was always intimidated by the super specials because they were bigger, but the book is actually the same length as the regular ones. They just add some activities in the back. I actually probably would have enjoyed those a lot as a kid, but I didn't realize that they were even in there. Super special two, Karen's plane trip. Karen goes on a plane to visit her grandparents in Nebraska. This one is weird to read at the end of the series. In one book from the main series, she's friends with Tia. I guess this is where she met her. I don't recall if she had already known Tia in the other book. She said Tia looks like a boy because she has short hair and wears overalls. She also thinks Tia is weird for riding a boy's bike. She would be so confused if she was in year 2022. It's also super bizarre to read about flying before 9-11. Karen's entire family walks her to the seats on the plane, and Karen's personal stewardess takes her to meet the pilot in the cockpit during the flight. Super special number three, Karen's mystery. Not sure where this fits in the timeline either. I just know that Boo Boo is still alive. Karen's obsessed with solving mysteries, and David Michael steals her rat. 
Super special number four, Karen, Hanny, and Nancy, the three musketeers. This one is written from the perspective of all three girls. The three musketeers have plans to spend all 91 days of summer together, but they realize that they want to see other people too. I notice that one of their dolls has the same name as Karen's future nanny. I feel like these specials on the last few books in the main series were very similar to other stories in the series. I feel like they kind of ran out of ideas. I wish they were more fresh, but that's hard when they don't even let her age. Super special five, Karen's baby. Nancy's little brother Daniel is born in this special and Karen gets dubbed God sister. Super special six, Karen's camp out. The three musketeers go to summer camp together. This one is written in the perspectives of Karen, Hanny, Nancy, David Michael, and Lenny. You randomly learn a lot about Hanny's brother Lenny. I'm curious why they only give him a personality in this book and nowhere else in the entire series. And that's it. Every one of the 128 books have been read. This series just reminded me that I don't want children on 10,000 levels. It also made me miss being a carefree seven-year-old. I don't think we could have a series like this these days. Kids don't play as much as they used to. Plus, with social media, they're more self-centered. Karen already was pretty self-centered in this. I can't imagine throwing an iPad and Instagram. Other than the endless time loop in this, I was also confused by the big house. Karen's parents were living in that nine-bedroom house with two kids but showed no interest throughout the series that would warrant the use of so many bedrooms, like wanting a library or a game room or an art room, etc. It's just weird to me that they had this size of house that was perfect for when he remarried, like it was some big plan of his all along. But anyway, this was fun and also painful at times, but I'm glad I finally finished the series. Has anyone else read these? Am I the only one? I've never met someone that's actually read these before. I don't think I've ever met someone that's even heard of this before. People generally just know the Babysitter's Club, not about her little sister. Sorry, Karen, you're living in Christie's shadow. I'm hoping to do this with other series in the future. I'm so busy with my 10th year of second grade, though, so we'll see.